My dear departed one, all six million of them are crying out to the world in a single word. Zachor, remember us. We were here. Don't forsake us. If you don't want to have another Holocaust in the world, you have to talk about it. Nazis did not start with killing. They started with hate. Once love and respect was eradicated by hate, it was easy to kill. I have dedicated my life to end this hatred. When we educate, we can prevent, and then we will ultimately prevail. Never Forget is the driving force behind the Zahor Holocaust Remembrance Foundation. We are dedicated to ensuring the remembrance of the Holocaust with community building efforts designed to guide positive change. Our mission is to make sure the Holocaust never happens again. Education is the gateway to prevention, and we provide tools for curriculum-based Holocaust studies, which teaches the virtues of perseverance, all while promoting peace and acceptance. Now, more than ever, Zachor needs your support to continue our mission through educational programs, events, and awareness to never again. Students, my name is Ben Lesser, and uh, I'm the founder of the Zahor Holocaust Remembrance Foundation. Very important foundation. Our mission is to keep this world from acquiring amnesia and to keep the Holocaust from ever happening again any place in the world. Anyway, I come to you from an era in history where civilization lost its humanity. It's hard, a time when there were only three kinds of people. There were the killers, the victims, and the bystanders. We now know that the whole world knew what was happening to Jewish people. But they chose to be silent, giving Hitler carte blanche to do with them anything he wished. And he did. Six million of us, a million and a half of whom were children. And the world was silent. I just can't get over it. And every time I talk about it, it hurts me in my heart. You see in front of you, my family. I come from a wonderful family of seven. My father, Lazar, my mother, Shari, and my oldest brother, Morris, and Goldie, and my little brother, Tuli. Now, all these people that you see in this picture all my members of my family were all slaughtered. None of them survived the Holocaust. The only survivors was my sister Lola and I. She is not in the picture, but you'll meet her later. I come, oh, here is Lola, my sister Lola and I. Um, So, I lived in Krakow, Poland, a beautiful city, and we lived in this building. It was a beautiful apartment house, three stories, and the three windows on the ground here that you see um, are bird windows, part, part of our um, apartment. And 
uh, on the other side of the gate, on the right side from me, the right side of the gate, there was another Jewish couple. They had two daughters who were younger than I was. And the mother gave birth to an infant little boy two months earlier, two months earlier. And one day in September of 1939, this whole building started to shake and rattle. So I ran to my window and I looked out of the window and I saw tanks were rolling down the street. Following the tanks, there were half tracks. And follow, in every few steps, if a soldier would jump out of the half track, get on the sidewalk, and this is how they occupied the city. There was no fighting. And, and following them were the Wehrmacht, the foot soldier with the shiny black boots and their goose steps. It was quite impressionable for a 10 and a half year old kid at that time. But no one really knew what to expect. If my parents knew they didn't say anything, they probably knew something because Kristallnacht happened a year earlier and if you don't know what Kristallnacht was, ask your teachers. The teachers will explain it to you. It was an awful time. But from Germany and Austria, all the Polish Jewish people were deported back to Poland. So my father must have known something, but nobody knew to what extent the Nazis would take this. So as soon as the soldiers passed, my street, I, my father called us into the dining room, set us down on the chairs, and this is what he said. Okay, from this moment on, there are no more kids. All of you are adults. You will obey, you will listen. There are no more children from this moment down. Okay. So this is what happened. Um, only the fifth day after occupation of Krakow, we found out what Nazi brutality was all about. Early in the morning, around 5 a.m., a truck pulls up to the gate of our building and they started to bang. There were soldiers there and the super came running out asking, well, what's going on? So all they wanted to know is where the Jewish people lived. And he was obliging them. He was showing that we lived on one side and on the other side, there was another Jewish couple. So they came breaking down the door and pistol whipping us while we were in bed. In their hands, they held sacks and they were screaming, throw in all your valuable money, gold, silver. Those sacks were open. They were holding it and throwing, beating us up and yelling to throw in everything of value. While they're beating up my father to open up the safe, we hear a screaming from our neighboring apartment. My sister Lola and I ran out through the kitchen door. We ran into their kitchen door to find out what's going on. And this is what we saw. We saw this monster was hold, holding the infant little boy by its legs and swinging him and yelling to the parents, make him shut up. The parents and the daughters were screaming, our baby, our baby, don't hurt our baby. With a smirk on his face, you can see he was enjoying what he was doing. 
he smashes the baby's head into the doorpost, killing it instantly. All of us jumped on him, this monster, and as his bodies heard something was going on, so they came running in and they pulled us off him. They pistol whipped us and they were a little shocked themselves to see what happened. They were, they were saying to him, okay, Hans, come on, let's go. They got together all the valuables they gathered from us they threw it in a sack and they threw it in this truck and they took off. This was only fifth day after occupation. From that day on, new ordinances started coming out fast and furious. A new ordinance you had to, there was a curfew. Jewish people couldn't be from seven to seven um, from seven in the morning to seven in the evening, you couldn't be on, I'm sorry, from seven in the evening to seven in the morning, you could not be on the street. You had to be in your home. And a new ordinance came in is that the Jewish people had to wear a Star of David from the age of six years on up, they had to wear a Star of David. You couldn't travel anymore. You had to have new IDs. The IDs had a J in it for Judah, a big J, to show that this is a Jew. All right, so they, they were beating up. Now, every morning you can find dead people on the streets. And the strange thing is that for the Jewish people, there were no judges, no juries, no prisons even, because if you disobeyed any of their ordinances, they simply shot you. And there were dead bodies every morning on the street. This went on for a, over a year, and then a new ordinance came in that the Jewish people can no longer reside in Krakow. If you wanted to live in Krakow, they gave us a choice. You had to go into the ghetto, ask your teachers, the teachers will explain to you what the ghetto is. And if you wanted to, so to stay in Krakow, you had to go into the ghetto. But they gave us a choice. We can move outside of Krakow and live in a small community, but not in a big city. That's when my father was preparing to go to the ghetto because everybody, uh, most of the people were going into the ghetto. Every member of my father's family went inside the ghetto. But just as my father is packing, a young man comes to the house by the name of Michael. And Michael says to my father, he says, Mr. Lesser, you know how I feel about Lola, my sister Lola. Someday I'd love to marry her, but do me a favor, come to the same community that my family is moving to. My father gave me a choice to go into the ghetto or to go to the small community called Nyepalomitsa, he agreed to go to Nyepalomitsa. That was miracle number one, because all the people who went into the ghetto, about a few months later, were all transported 
to extermination camp called Belzec. And everyone who lived in the ghetto was killed in Belzec. So all my fam family members from my father's side were all killed in Belzec. And we moved to that community. Also, what happened is on the way, um, while we were packing, we found out that my father had 1,000 American dollars that he saved up for a rainy day. You know, he, had, he was in business in wine and syrup, and also he had a chocolate factory, and everything was confiscated. But my father had a thousand dollars that he saved up. That was a small fortune in those days. So he took a religious book and he pasted it in between the pages and put it in a sack full of books. We had two sacks of books and we put it on the wagon and we we're now leaving. One hour out of the city of Krakow, we're being stopped. Halt. Two husky Nazis jump on the wagon. The first thing they wanted to know, do we have any Jewish literature, books? And they saw two sacks full of books. They picked them up and they heaved it on the side of the road. They had a mountain full of books on the side of the road. It seems like every person who did not go into the ghetto had to cross this road and they were confiscating these books and they were gonna have a bonfire once everybody passed. My sister Lola spoke a beautiful German. She walks up to this monster and she says, look, my father is a writer. He wrote his autobiography. Let him keep this one book. He looked at her. Maybe he liked the way she spoke German. He says, okay, I'll give you five minutes if you can find it. And the whole family has started to climb on the mountain of books and we couldn't find it. All these books looked alike. And after five minutes, he chased us away. Now, my father had a family of six on the wagon with him. We were a family of seven. My oldest sister, Goldie, was in Munkaj, which is Hungary. My mother's side of the family, my grandparents, she went to visit my grandparents in Munkaj, and when the war broke out, she got stuck there. So it was good because Munkaj was a free country, it was Hungary. So she stayed with my grandparents in Hungary but the rest of us were all on the wagon. My father is out of money. He doesn't have a penny how to feed us. Mm. Jewish people are not allowed to be hired, so he couldn't get a job. And he comes to this farmhouse, which is a house that Michael rented for my parents. Half of the house was the farmer, an apple orchard farmer, and the other half was ours. Now, between the two apartments, there was a baking oven. People would bake their own breads. When my future brother-in-law, Michael, heard what happened to my father, he brought my father a sack full of flour, figuring he'll be able to bake bread to feed the family. My father, when he saw the flower, his face lit up. Instead of baking bread to feed the family, he started to bake pretzels. 
why pretzels? All you need for pretzels is flour, water, and salt. And those ingredients he had. Then he took those pretzels to the neighboring bars, taverns, and he offered it for sale. It was a novelty. They started to buy it. Now he became a little baker in that community. I was 12 years old and I remember baking with my father. To this day, I still like to bake at home for the family. This lasted for about a year, a little over a year. And my sister Lola marries Michael. And then she marries, she moves out of the house and she moves to a duplex. And the other side of the duplex was the owner of the duplex who happened to be a mayor of that community. This was the wedding parties that you see. But look at this picture. Out of all these people in this picture, only three of us survived. Michael, Lola, and myself. The three of us were the only survivors. In this white little suit was my little brother. He was my little brother resting against my mother uh, here. None of these people survived except for the three of us. So one day the mayor of that community, Michael's and Lola's landlord, comes home. He says, Michael, Lola, save yourselves. We heard a rumor so there's going to be a raid against the Jewish people either tonight or tomorrow. So save yourselves. When Michael heard that, he went out and he rented the wagon with the driver, horse and buggy. In the middle of the night, we snuck out with whatever we can put on the buggy and we left. The only place we can go to was a city called Bochnia. Bochnia was the closest city, and Bochnia had a ghetto. So that meant we had to go inside the ghetto. Bochnia ghetto had a very bad reputation. Every so often, two or three dump trucks would come in the ghetto, and the Nazis would go from house to house and pull out the children from their beds and throw them into these dump trucks. If, as they filled up these dump trucks, they would start to pull out of the ghetto. The parents were running behind these trucks and screaming for their children. The children were screaming for the parents. But these cultured people had machine guns at the end of each truck, and they would mow down the parents running behind the trucks. This resonated throughout Europe. Stay away from Bochnia ghetto because of this. But we had no choice. We had to either stay in town or leave, and this is the closest place we can go to so we it's a good thing we did go we did leave because that night there was a raid later on at night there was a raid and the nazis were going from house to house pulling out all the jewish people and, and putting them into trucks and the man was taken to, to a forest. The men were given shovels. They had to dig a ditch and everybody was shot. How do we know this? Lola, my sister Lola and I 
are the only survivors who survived the war from our family. We went back to Nyepalomitsa to find out what happened to all the people. And when we came there, we found out that almost everybody, everybody was shot in the forest. There were, there were farmers who would go to the forest to pick mushrooms and berries to sell in the market in the morning they were hiding behind trees and they saw these trucks put pull in and they were telling us that the ground was moving for three days later they saw everything that happened so it was good that we left to to bochnia bochnia ghetto the the driver unloaded us in the middle of the street, in the middle of the street, and we were sitting there when Michael sees a Jewish policeman who happened to be a school buddy that he went to school with. His name was uh, uh, Farber. So, Michael Farber says to Michael, what are you doing here? And Michael tells him the story. Farber says, don't worry, Michael, I have a place for you. He took him and his and my, my sister Lola, his wife. And, and Michael's family to an apartment. And he took my father, my mother, and myself, my little brother, to another apartment. Just to let you know what ghetto living was like. There were eight other people in that room. Only one room, a big room. Eight other people. Now we were 12. We had no beds that was thrown on the ground. And there were mattress, I mean, there were blankets on top of the straw. There were blankets hanging from the ceiling, separating each family. And all of this, all of this, went on in this room i can't explain it to you it was so crowded and we couldn't sleep and we heard everybody crying and my god it was broken furniture in the room and there was one piece of furniture where you hang your jackets and your coats that so was a very nice piece of furniture i didn't pay any attention to that but everybody in the ghetto had to work. I was about 12 years old and my job was working in a uniform factory. I was sewing on buttons on uniforms. It was easy work, but it was 13 hours a day, very little sleep and very little food. After about a year of this, Farber, this friendly policeman, goes to Michael and tells him, Look, Michael, save yourselves, hide someplace because there's going to be a raid tonight. Ever since those trucks would come in and pull out the children from their beds, every apartment and every house had a hiding place. They called it the bunker. That's when I found out our hiding place, our bunker was a nice piece of furniture where you hang your coats and jackets. As you push the coats and jackets apart, apart, there, there was a hole in the wall, and you push apart the panel in the hole 
on the wall and there was a hole and people could, 12 of us could hide on the other side of the wall. The last person had to uh, close the door and put back the, the, the clothing back in place and the back panel slide it back and close it up. And we stood there all night freezing cold Fortunate for us, the outside of the walls were connected, so they couldn't see us. But the, the roof was open, and it was snowing, and was ice cold, really cold. And we kept freezing and holding each other and shaking. And we hear screaming, dogs barking outside. We heard these wild dogs were tearing apart our neighbors, shooting all night long. Towards morning, it got quiet. When it got quiet, they dared to come out. When we came out, we couldn't believe what we saw outside. In the snow, people laying, half that, uh, torn apart by, um, not this picture yet, uh, Ralph, this is the wrong picture. Um, and people were laying in the snow and torn apart. My mother were holding an infant, you couldn't recognize them. And there were people going around in push carts and picking up these bodies and putting them in the push carts and taking him to the ghetto square, piling them up as high as they could. And these cultured people would come with machine guns. No, I'm sorry, would come with gasoline cans and throw gasoline over the bodies. And they started a human bonfire in Bochnia ghetto square. Imagine the smell, the screams from some people who were still alive and others were in hiding. The first thing I wanted to know is what happened to my sister Lola. My sister Lola, and her husband and his family, we're hiding in a doghouse. You heard the doghouse. So Lola is telling the story as they were about to go into the doghouse and other Jewish policeman walks up to them by the name of Morris Schiller. And he says, Michael, Lola, I know about your hiding place in this doghouse. Unless you take my mother and my sister next to me and along with you, I'm gonna tell the authorities. Well, there was only room for seven. Now there were nine. So Lola and Michael decided to walk away so the other seven could go inside the doghouse and hide. And as they were walking away, they meet the friendly policeman, uh, the friendly policeman, um, and, and he says, Michael and Lola, what are you doing? Don't you know uh, you should be hiding someplace? So Michael tells him the story. Farber says, Michael, Lola, where my sister is hiding with her two children, there is room for you, follow me. And he took them to a, lab, to a leather tannery. Above the tannery, there was a water tower. He says, inside that tower is my sister and her two children. Climb up on this ladder, lower yourself with the rope inside, and towards the morning when you hear my knock on the tank, that's a signal, you can come out, the coast is clear. 
This is exactly what they did. They ro lowered themselves with ropes inside, and Lola picked up the baby, the infant little baby the mother was holding, and his sister was standing in water, uh, and it, knee deep in water and freezing and shaking, and his his uh, her her daughter is standing uh, waist high in water, and they're all three of them, and they were shaking. And so Lola picked up the baby, and Michael picked up the girl from the water, and they held each other, and they stood there in this water shaking. They were little water rats swimming around and nibbling at their feet. And they kept shaking him off all night. And all night long, they heard screaming, dogs barking, shooting, the same thing that we heard before. And uh, towards morning, when it got quiet, there was this knock on the tank. And that meant the coast is clear, you can come out. And they, pulled themselves up. As they came outside, the first thing they wanted to do, put a little bit of circulation into their legs. And the first thing Lola Michael wanted to do is go to the doghouse and see what happened to his family. When they came to the doghouse, this is what they saw. Now you can show, right, this is what they saw. The whole family, including the mother and the, the, the sister of, of Morris Schiller, everybody with a bullet hole in the middle of their head. Little Marika here in the corner is still holding on to a doll that Lola made her for her seventh birthday. When Lola saw that, she started to scream. Michael stopped her because they may still be around burning bodies. So with a quelched cry, they knew what they had to do. They knew what they had to do. Michael went out and he found a riggedy, a riggedy wheelbarrow and he put the family on the wheelbarrow. And he is pushing him to the cemetery. He came to the cemetery. Here it is. Marika still holding on to the doll. Uh, he's pushing him to the cemetery. At the cemetery, they were able to get a shovel and with frozen ground on Lola was able with Michael to dig out a grave to, to put in their family. And this is Lola's crying because her hands are swollen from digging up this icy cold ground. The whole family is being buried. Anyway, to tell the story now, um, I can, I can, I'm going to skip part of it because to, to tell you how we were able to get out of the ghetto and take 55 people with us is a story in itself. Uh, I only hope that you read my book and that's the only way you're going to find out because this is too long of a story for me to say. Yeah, Ben, we'll share all of that with everybody, how they can get a, whole, a copy of your book um, before we wrap up today. So we're going to be sharing that that link in the chat as well as in the video. Okay. So I'm just telling you that we are now outside the ghetto. And outside the ghetto, Michael befriends a truck driver who happened to haul, haul coal 
and he asked him if he would convert his truck into a double decker where there is room between the coal and the chassis to hide people and they will pay him a lot of money if he would take those people to the border and at the border we'll have a smuggler smuggle us across to Czechoslovakia and then to Hungary. Hungary was a free country, but it cost a lot of money to escape from Poland. And however, there was there were some people who had money and they offered to pay for our family to be smuggled across, but they would only allow two from our family to go in the truck with each trip. So my oldest brother, Morris, was arrested and sent to a concentration camp to Plashov. Um, it's in the book why he was arrested, what happened. And my Oh, my sister Lola, my oldest sister, of course, Goldie, was in Mungaj, Hungary. She was free. So now there were only my father, my mother, myself, my little brother, and my sister with her husband, Michael. Michael and Lola went first on the first trip. There was room for 10 people in this truck, five and five, just like like sardines and why did michael and lola go first because you couldn't always trust the drivers sometimes what the drivers would take your money and then turn you into the gestapo and they got paid ransom money for for jewish people trying to escape so they went first and we made up a password if the driver comes back with the right password, that means you can trust him. And if he comes back with the wrong password, don't trust him. Two days later, the driver came back with the right password and it was time for, uh, for another 10 people, including myself and my little brother. My mother and my father insisted that we go first and they were going to be last. So, which we did. And we are now on our way about an hour out of the city of Bochnia. We're being stopped and two, um, we're being stopped and, and, we, and we can see a bunch of soldiers with their rifles from the through the cracks of the trucks. We can see, and and, and they were talking to the driver. Uh, the, they were talking to the driver, and the driver was asking. I don't know what they were saying because we could not hear the roar of the engine was so loud. So anyway. After a while, the truck started to move. We felt relieved until we saw through the cracks of the trucks on each step on, on the side of the cab, the cab, there was a soldier with a rifle standing there. And now we heard soldiers walking on top of the coal. The coal dust was coming down and my little brother is about to sneeze. So I'm holding his nose in his mouth. We didn't know where they're taking us, but we figured somebody's turned, turned us in. They're taking us to a forest or someplace and they're gonna shoot us. After two hours, the truck stops again. And we are saying our prayers, when suddenly we hear, Danke schön, Danke schön, Danke schön. They were only hitchhiking. Imagine the relief. And, and the truck started to move again. We were like reborn again. 
there was just hitchhiking. About three or four hours later, we arrived at the forest. It was nighttime. He told us to go out of the truck. He told us, walk into the forest. About 300 yards, there is a tool shed. Inside the tool shed, there's a smuggler who happened to be a forest ranger. Walk up there and you're going to meet him. And sure enough, we met him and he took us to the forest about two kilometers away. And he made us lay down on our stomach. He says, look up. And we look up and we can hardly see, but we see something is moving. He tells us those are the soldiers and with their dogs, they're moving, moving up and down on the, the other side of the barbed wire. At 3 a.m., they're going to move down the hill and they're going to meet fresh soldiers and they're going, the fresh ones are going to move up, but there's about 10 minutes in between, they have a little ceremony. Between the ceremony period, we can cross the border. And sure enough, we saw them walk down the hill. And then once they were far enough away, we shimmied our way up and we came up to the border. The smuggler picked up the wire and he told us to cross to the other side. But he says on the other side of the wire, there is a big mountain, a big uh, well, a drop, a mountain, a big drop. So be careful because if you're going to tumble, it's all over. Sit down at the edge of the mountain, hold hands and slide down the mountain you will eventually reach a plateau and you'll be okay, just slide down, which is what we did. It was pitch black, you couldn't see your hand in front of you. And when we hit the plateau, I asked my little brother, are you okay? He says, yes. While he says, yes, all of a sudden, somebody taps me on my shoulder I jump out of my skin. He says, Bainish? Nobody called me that except a member of the family. So he says, I'm your uncle Bela, your mother's brother. I came here. Uh, how did you know where to find me? Uh, he says, your sister Lola went through two days ago. They contacted us. They told us exactly the spot. So I waited here for you, and I'm going to smuggle you across the Czech border to Hungary. Now, that's another story, and it's going to take too long crossing the borders, but I'm going to skip that just to tell you that we are now in Hungary. In Hungary, we there was a wagon waiting for us. We got on the wagon. They took us to a small community. There was a railroad station and we waited for the train. We boarded the train, took us to Budapest. In Budapest, we met M Lola and Michael. Very happy to see each other. We had a good meal together. We had to go do something I hated to do. We had to go into jail to become uh, legalized in, in Hungary. So my uncle had to take, take us to a jail. They put us in a cell for about 15 or 20 minutes while he signed some documents that he is going to be the, um, he's going to, he's going to be the, uh, uh, Anyway, he'll take care of us. Uh, he is responsible for us because we're still minors. 
Okay, so we are we're under his protection and he took us the next morning to the railroad and we went to Munkaj. Munkaj was the town where my sister Goldie was with my grandparents, my uncles, my aunts, my cousins. My whole family from my mother's side were waiting there for us when we arrived when we arrived, we embraced and we were very happy to see each other. I told everybody what's happening in, in Poland and most of them didn't believe it. And those who believed it said, this will never happen in Hungary because Hungary is an ally of Germany. Why would Germany siphon off the soldiers from their front to occupy a friendly country when they needed every soldier fighting on the front. And it didn't make sense. But my uncle believed me. My uncle invited me to stay in his house with my little brother. And he was a wealthy man. He had a uh, yardage goods store where he was selling yardage for suits and for dresses and the house was above the store and he, he listened to me and i told him that if the nazis ever come in here to hungary they will confiscate everything that you own it would make a lot of sense if you converted some of your assets into diamonds or jewelry or something we can hide on our body and he listened to me one day he came home with boxes full of shoes beautiful black shoes for every member of the family and he told us knows that in the heels of these shoes there are diamonds use it only in a life-threatening situation knows that you have diamonds in your shoes well he gave us all the shoes and life in hungary went on normal people were going to proms and weddings and bar mitzvahs and and going to temple and going to weddings and to dances and you, you'd never believe there was a war going on until march of 1944 the Matis just marched right in like they were invited guests. Strange things that when they came in, they knew where every Jewish person lived. They knew our addresses, they knew our uh, education, our businesses, everything. How? They didn't have computers in those days. IBM had punch cards and they would sell these punch cards to whoever would pay the price. IBM doesn't deny it, but they said they had no idea for what purpose they're going to use these names. And within two months, they were already shipping out some Jewish people to the death camps. This is what they told us. Everybody will be relocated to Germany. Bring along all your valuables, your bundles, everything that you can carry with you, bring along but leave everything else behind. Anyone found hiding will be shot immediately. And most people believe that they took along their belonging and 
we were all marched to the railroad station. At the railroad station, they counted out 80 to, to cattle car. And while we were waiting to get into cattle car, a two men with the stretcher walked right up to us and they set down the stretcher right next to me. I look at this woman, I didn't recognize her, but suddenly I saw it was my sister Goldie, all bloody black and blue, you couldn't recognize her. I said, Goldie, what happened to you? She says, I tried to escape. I went as far as the railroad station and a Hungarian gendarme who recognized me because he went to school with me, turned me into the SS and they beat her to a pulp. Now they order us to go into our cattle cars. 80 to a cattle car. You can't imagine how tight it was. But it was, wouldn't, wouldn't have been that bad if it was only 80 without the bundles that everybody had, the bundle and a valise. Now it was so tight that if somebody wanted to sit down, someone else had to stand up. In the corner inside the cattle car, there were two buckets full of water. Once the water was gone, there were no sanitary facilities, no toilets. Imagine 80 people, men, women, children, infants, pregnant women. They started to use those buckets. Now the buckets were filled up one day, two days, three days. They were overflowing. Now we were happy we had bundles. We can sit on the bundles instead of sitting on the human waste on the bottom on the floor. The third night, we pass a railroad station and it says Oshwinchim. Oshwinchim was Polish for Auschwitz. We didn't know that. I didn't know about the Auschwitz team. I didn't know about Auschwitz. It was still nighttime. The train stops and they open up the door and all hell broke loose. The Nazis were screaming, Rouse, Rouse, Schnell. The dogs were barking. There were some inmates with striped clothes lips yelling in every language, Polish, German, Hebrew, Yiddish. Leave all your belonging where it is. Don't you pick anything up. Women and children to the right, men to the left. I was 15 and a half years old. I wasn't a child and I wasn't a man either. So I could have gone, I'm holding on to my little brother, Tuli, my little, my sister Goldie, and we're just being pulled apart, never to see each other again. They went straight to the gas chambers. Who knew? And for some reason, I didn't go with my sister and my little brother. Even though I was only 15 and a half, I went with my uncle, my cousin, because I felt that if this is a labor camp and if we labor, if we work, they'll feed us better. This was my reasoning. Therefore, I went with my uncle. 
and we're standing there in line and the line is moving forward and I see a man with a white frog like a, a doctor and white gloves and he's going like this with his index finger left right left right left right 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 i didn't know what he was doing but he is sending people to different sides and i come closer he asked a young man he says comes to five kilometers laufen can you run five kilometers or would you rather go by truck this young man says he had a bad knee he'd rather go by truck poor soul not realizing that meant certain death i didn't realize it either but I figured there is something not right because I see the barracks. Why would he ask, can you run five kilometers? I figured he's just testing us to see if we're strong enough to work. So I tell my uncle, my cousin, let me go first. But whatever he asks you, tell him, yes, you can run. Tell him you can work. You're healthy. Let me go first. I go and, and I stretch myself out in front of him. Remember, I was 15 and a half. I stretched myself out. Before he asked me anything, I said, 18 Jahre alt, gesund und arbeitsfähig. I'm, I'm 18 years old. I'm healthy and I can work. Then he asked me, comes to five kilometers laufen, can I run five kilom kilometers? I said, yeah, well, yes. He sent me to the left. My uncle and cousin also came to the left. This was another miracle because if I would have gone, uh, two miracles just happened. If I would have gone with my sister, my little brother, I would have wound up in the gas chamber. If I would have told him I was 15 and a half, I would have wound up in the gas chamber. So my uncle and my cousin and I are led through with a whole bunch of men. And we see these flames are shooting out from these chimneys about five chimneys with fire coming out of it with ashes and every time you make a step you make a footprint in the ashes and the man ahead of me were saying oh those those must be smelting factories smelting them probably this is probably where we will be working <clears throat> Who knew? This gate you see is the gate from Auschwitz. We saw this gate of Auschwitz, but the train didn't stay there. It moved away and then moved another three kilometers to Birkenau. And Birkenau was where they opened up the, the, the cars and, and all hell broke loose anyway after the selection they took us to a big auditorium and they told us all to get undressed get out of your shoes and walk up to those barbers they're gonna cut your hair and then you'll go into the showers so picture this I had these black shoes with the diamonds in it. And I get undressed, but I did not get out of my shoes. 
I didn't want to let go of those diamonds. My uncle who gave me those shoes and the diamonds and his son too, they got out of them because we were ordered to get out. I took a chance and I walk up to the barbers. They cut my hair all over my body. They weren't exactly gentle the way they cut me either. And nobody said a word about my shoes. And their guards going back and forth and looking at all of us, but they didn't say anything about my shoes. Imagine if they would have seen my shoes, they would have shot me. I disobeyed an order. But a miracle happened. Nobody saw it. Nobody said anything. They just let me go into the showers with my shoes. And after the shower, they gave us these striped clothes. I put on the other clothes. And, and they also gave us a pair of shoes. They were uh, wooden soles with canvas on top. And I got onto those shoes, the black shoes I put under my arms, under my jacket. And I ran, ran out with a group there taking us to the barracks. At the barracks, the Stubmeldester comes out. The man in charge of the barracks comes out. He says, ha, you Hungarian Jews. By the way, he spoke in a broken uh, German, but I can tell that he was from Poland because I was from Poland too. I could tell he was a Polish inmate. So he says, ha, you Hungarian Jews. You think you're here on vacation? Think again. You see those chimneys, those ashes? Those are your mothers, your fathers, your brothers, and your sisters. And if you don't behave and do exactly what you're told, this is how you're going to wind up. Ashes. And he chased us in. He told us to take a barrack, uh, take a bunk in the barrack. My uncle, my cousin, and I took an upper bunk. We laid down and we fell asleep. About an hour later, my cousin wakes me up. Ben, get up, get up, get up. I open my eyes. I said, well, what's going on? He says, listen. And I hear a chanting or a crying or a praying. I didn't know what it was. <clears throat> and then he says, look, one side of the barrack, there was a board missing in the wall, and I can see an orange shoe like a flame shooting up. He says, what is it? And I says, I don't know, but I'll find out. So I went to the Stubmeldeste, and I <clears throat> excused myself in Polish, and when he heard Polish, he was so happy to he can speak his own language. Somebody, <clears throat> I asked him, what's going on? He says, ha, you Hungarian Jews, you know nothing. Six months before Hungary was ever occupied by the Germans, we in Auschwitz knew they were going to do that because they made us dig ditches, fiery pits for the influx of the Hungarian Jews. They knew the Jews would be coming in so fast and furious. There'll be no time to, to kill them any other way but to send them and throw them into fiery pits. He was even telling me how long it takes to kill in the gas chambers. He says it takes a half an hour to kill in the gas chambers. But they didn't have a half an hour. After 15 minutes, 
they will pull everybody out. After 15 minutes, they would open the doors, air it out for a few minutes, pull everybody out, cut their hair, pull out their gold teeth, and throw them into dump trucks now, instead of putting them on gurneys to take it to the crematorium. That was too slow. They're throwing them in dump trucks. And the infants, they wouldn't even allow in the gas chambers because they take up too much room. They would take the infants away from the mothers and now they were throwing the infants alive on top of these trucks. Imagine that. They were taking these trucks to the fiery pits and throwing in these bodies one by one. And this is the screaming that we heard, the screaming, the yelling all day and all night long for two weeks without a stop this hasn't stopped for a minute we heard it was that was going on in auschwitz and after two weeks they put us in trucks and they took us out of auschwitz and they took us to a labor camp called dernhau dernhau was a rock Quarry. As they dynamited the mountain, it was our job with sledgehammers to break it down, the, the boulders, it break them down to manageable pieces, throw them into mining carts, run it down the hill to the grinding machines where they made gravel out of it, and then push it back up push it back, back up the hill. It was a terrible, it was hard labor. I figured my uncle would never survive it. So I, I bribed the chef from the kitchen who happened to be in the same barrack that we were. And I gave him the diamonds from my shoes to give my uncle a job in the kitchen. He took the diamonds and he did give my uncle a job in the kitchen. It got a little easier for us after my uncle was there, he could eat a little more. Anyway, every day when we came back from work, everybody from the kitchen, everybody working in the camp had to come in to be counted and they lined us up in rows of five and they counted us they counted and counted and counted and the commandant comes down he says i'm going to teach the schweinhund the lesson they'll never forget he's going to teach us pick dogs a lesson we'll never forget what happened three inmates escaped and because of this, he orders every 10th person in line to receive 25 lashes, 25 lashes, which is exactly what they did. Um, this gate is in Auschwitz. We're in now, we're not in Auschwitz. Okay, thank you, thank you. Anyway, as they were counting every 10th person in line, I can see that my uncle is going to be a number 10. So I pushed him behind me and I took his place and I became a number 10. They took us number 10 in the middle of the yard. They brought down uh, hardwood stakes one by one, about two and a half or three feet long. And they brought down a sawhorse, which is in the picture you see of sawhorse. And this is what they made us do. Tiptoe in front of the sawhorse, bend over or your stomach cannot touch the sawhorse. One man was pulling your trousers real tight. 
while the other man was hitting you with these canes as hard as could be with those hardwood stakes. You had to count out loud. If you miscounted or your heels touch the ground or your stomach touches the two by four, you keep starting all over again from one. So every time you miscount, you start from one again. Every time your heel touches the ground, you start from one again. Your stomach touches the two by four, you start from one again. It was almost impossible. The first man goes up and after he miscounted and his heel touched the ground and again and again and again, finally he falls down. When he falls down, the commandant walks over to him, pulls out his revolver and shoots him right in the temple. His Fräulein, who happened to be with him, walks over to him and gives him a hug and a kiss like he just performed a heroic act. He killed a man. Anyway, the second man walks over the same way. He couldn't take it, he miscounted, he touched, he fell. The commandant goes over, kicks him in the face, get up, he couldn't, he shoots him right in the temple. So we have two dead bodies. Then the third one goes up. The third one was a younger man. And he the same, he miscounted. He touched the ground, he touched the two by four. Again and again, he, he yells out, please have mercy on me, do not kill me. So the commandant says then, stand up, come over here and face me. He stands up, walks five steps, his knees gave out from under him. He falls, the commandant goes over and shoots him. We have three dead bodies. Ben Lesser is next in line. What can I tell you? I walk over to that sawhorse, tiptoed, bend over without touching the two by four. One man is pulling my trousers real tight and they start hitting me and I sell, yell out, ice, zwei, dry. And I said to myself, Ben, this is it. Another few minutes and they'll kill you. You have to do it exactly the way they tell you. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, and twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, finally, twenty, twenty-one, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-one, twenty-one. 25, 25, I made it. No one could believe in the camp that anyone could survive this. You can hear a pin drop in the whole camp. The man who was pulling my trousers tight is telling me in Yiddish, he says, go over and thank him. So I walk over to the commandant, blood is running down my back of my, my legs. I walk over to him, I salute and I say, Danke schön, Herr Commandant. When he hears that, just like a child who gets sick of a toy, he and throws it away, he sends all of us number 10, back to our line originally. And he tells his henchmen to bring down a portable gallow to hang those three inmates who were 
were they caught and they brought them back. You couldn't recognize them. They were all bloodied, black and blue. I remember the last man, the third man, they put a noose around his neck. He yelled out, Shema Yisrael, which is a Jewish prayer. It's only six words. It says, listen, God. God, you're one, something like to that nature. It says, Shema Yisrael, which means, anyway, uh, it's a Jewish prayer, only six words. And they heard it. So they kicked the stool out from under him. They wouldn't let him complete the last two words. Adonai Echad, God is one. They wouldn't let him complete that. They were such sadists. And they afterwards they dismissed us like nothing ever happened. We went for our rations, we went for it and take our showers. For weeks I could not lay on my back because of the the welts that I had all over my back. I had to lay on my stomach. One night we heard cannon fire. The, the front was closing in. And when we went to report to work, there was a loudspeaker said, nobody's going to work today. The camp is being evacuated. Line up in rows of fives and march out of the camp. I was with my cousin. My uncle was already in the kitchen working. We couldn't say goodbye to him. And they had us march out. That was called the death march because if you could not keep up with the pace of the soldiers, they simply shot you. And all day long you heard pop, pop, pop. People were being shot. Okay, we were marching one week, two weeks, three weeks. It got so bad we didn't know day or night anymore. Uh, how, what time? I recently found out from a German school teacher who read my book and they loved the book. They said, they called us up. They said, Mr. Lesser made a mis two mistakes in the book. One mistake is he said he marched three or four weeks. Mr. Lesser marched seven weeks, 459 kilometers from, from one camp to the other, from Dernhau to Buchenwald was for, all, all of those, that my seven weeks of marching. I have no idea how I survived. I do remember the last few days my shoes fell apart and I was walking barefooted on snow. To this day, I'm having problem with my feet. We arrived at a camp called Buchenwald. Buchenwald was a major concentration camp. They counted us and they told us to go into this barrack. They're going to feed you. You can take a shower and they'll give you fresh clothes. And tomorrow morning at 8 a.m., you have to be back on the spot because we're, Buchenwald is also being evacuated, which is exactly what they did. And next morning, 
they counted us and they marched us out about 300 yards out of the camp you see a bunch of cattle cars lined up a bunch of train a train with cattle cars they counted us 82 cattle car and they ordered us to march in to get in i pushed my cousin up and i say to him find this spot against the wall because i remember going to auschwitz there were people all around me in the in the that in that train and it was terrible i find the spot where we can rest our 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 back against the wall and he went ahead and he found the spot and i followed him he found a good spot for me too and we are there at, after an hour they closed the doors and two hours later they opened the doors and they threw in 80 breads a bread for every person picture that those people next to the door were grabbing two or four breads or five breads those of us against the wall had nothing we don't know where we're going for how long we're going to be gone i knew i had to get some bread so i started to climb over the inmates over their heads to get to my to get to a, somebody who had several breads and pull out the bread and on the way somebody had that pocket knife and they stabbed me and i feel blood is filling up my mouth but i couldn't stop i needed the bread so i keep climbing and this man had many breads i pulled one away he kicked me and i went put it in my back pocket and i climbed back to my cousin my cousin says ben what's happening look at you you're bleeding i put my finger here and my throat and it went right through my tongue i had a big gash to this day you can still see it over my chin bone only i i filled up i was skinny i was and it was the middle of my throat but now that i filled up it's over my chin bone and it's so many years later you can still see the mark I had one bread, and I don't know how I was able to ration it out for two weeks. I was given a piece to my cousin the size of one half an egg and the size of a half an egg to me. And it lasted for two weeks. And after two weeks, we were out of bread completely, no water, no bread and the train was shuttling us back and forth for another week and after three weeks we came to a place called Dachau and Dachau they opened up the door and they yelled anyone who can walk out walk over these tracks into the camp of Dachau out of our cattle cars out of the 80 of us this picture was taken while I was showering in Buchenwald. This is a story in itself. It's a long story and I can't tell you. I don't know how they found it. But anyway, uh, it was probably taken by some soldiers, Nazis who were there. Uh, where was I? Excuse me. You arrived at, at Buchenwald. I arrived at Dachau. Oh, Dachau. Sorry. Sorry. Thank, thank you, Ralph. And I came into the other side of the camp. This is the front gate. We came in through the back where the tracks are. 
if you didn't see this building, all we see is a whole bunch of people as high as, high, high as you can see, people lying, laying there, dead people. Apparently, they ran out of coal. They could not burn the people anymore, so they were piling them up. And out of the cattle car that we were in, only four of us walked out. <clears throat> Myself, my little brother, and my little, I'm sorry, myself, my cousin, and I. My cousin and I walked out. There were two other people who walked out of the 80 of us. Everybody was dead. No food, no water for three weeks. Imagine. Everybody died. Only 18 people out of a train of 7,000 walked in alive to Dachau. My second mistake that the school teacher pointed out in my book was that I said this that train had 3,000 people. It was 7,000 people. And today I'm the only survivor left from that, that train. Nobody else is alive except I am still alive. Anyway, they light, put us into a barrack and against the wall there and we we're waiting one day two days three days and we heard bafraim bafraim liberation americans americans i tell my cousin let's go out and see what's going on and we hold each other barely walking out and we see the inmates are crawling on their hands and knees and kissing the boots from the GIs, they were like angels to us. They liberated us, Americans, Americans, they liberated us. Anyway, while we are standing there, two GIs walk up to us and they open up a can of Span. It smelled so good and we made a mistake. We ate some. We ate some of that Span. My cousin dies in my arm, the night of liberation, he dies on my arm. And I'd keep talking to him and talking to him. They saw me, so they came to take him away. So I followed, where are you taking my cousin? So a few steps, my knees went up, out, and I fell. When I fell, they pushed me to a wall, about two hours later, a man walks up to me, nicely dressed, and he says to me in a broken German, he says, um, what languages do I speak? I, I told him the languages, he hears Polish. Polish, I am a Jesuit, I'm a Jesuit priest from Poland. I came here with nuns, and with doctors from Paris, and we we're opening up a field hospital in the camp of Dachau, and I'm going to take you there. So he picks me up like a bag of bones. I was only weighing about 60 pounds, and I, at the age of 16, I was 16 years old, 60 pounds. He took me on the shoulder. He took me there and he told me on the way something I'll never forget. He says, Benek, what you went through is so unbelievable. It's so terrible. Uh, and the only crimes that you committed, you were born to Jewish parents. What, what an injustice. However, he says, don't you ever abandon your noble religion. To hear that from a Jesuit priest in 1945 was very unusual. Today you can hear it. And he took me to the infirmary and non ch checked my vitals. And I passed out. Two and a half months later, I woke up in Santa Tillian. 
a monastery in Bavaria. The monks gave up one building to make a hospital for the survivors of the camps. And I, two and a half months later, I wake up there. My story continues, but I think I better stop. I'm sure that some schools, uh, some teachers would like to have their students back in their class. Anyway, if you have any questions, go ahead and ask me. My story continues for a long, long time, and it's very, very interesting. Believe me, you don't want to miss it. Thank you. Yes, and thank you, Ben Tudabarat. Thank you so much. We, we, we cannot thank you enough. Happy Hanukkah. We know, we know that recently started, and we really appreciate all of the time that you have invested today in sharing your story. Guys, if you want to find out more, definitely purchase Ben's book. It's on ZahorFoundation.org, and we'll be sharing that out to everyone who participated today. So we're going to go ahead and jump in to some questions. I have a question from <clears throat> Elena. And she is in Europe. Elena, you should be able to unmute to ask your question. Go ahead. Yes. Okay. Um, so how do you how did you feel about German people in 1944? Huh. In 1944, I was <laughs> well, I didn't hate the German people. I hated the Nazis. The Nazis I hated with a passion. But the German people as a whole, you couldn't blame. Uh, they could have been a little more vocal and tried to help the Jewish people, but they didn't. I didn't blame. I couldn't blame their children anyway. Well, yeah, that's absolutely unimaginable, you know, everything that you've gone through and definitely your perspective is one in a trillion, uh, being the last surviving member of the Dachau death train in all of these camps and just how, how far and wide, how many hundreds of kilometers it, it, it traveled. Um, so um, I have a, a question from one of our students wanted to know uh, a question and I'm going to go ahead. His name is Legru. Legru, and I apologize if I mispronounce your name, uh, but go ahead and unmute to ask. You had a, a very good question. So actually, my name is Michael. But Sorry. The question, the question I want to say is, uh, first of all, you're a hero for me. And do you know what happened to your ankle after everything? Do I know what happened to what? My your uncle. What, do you know oh, what uh, ultimately happened? I don't know what happened to him, but he did not survive. So I can just picture they probably, I imagine they probably sent him to Auschwitz or they killed him there. Who knows? He didn't survive. So, uh, and, and we're terribly sorry about everything. And, and guys, I can't stress this enough. Definitely check out his video. And you guys don't need to keep putting your hands up. If you have a question, put it in the chat and we'll let you ask it. Thank you. So um, one of our students, uh, I'm going to let Paul Victor, Paul, go ahead. I don't know where you're at. I'm guessing you're somewhere in France. Go ahead and unmute to ask your question for Ben. Go ahead, Paul. Um, yeah. What message would you give to young people about your story? So he would like to know what message would you like young people to learn from your story? Yes. Uh, the message is while individuals can't always choose what happens to them, but whether it's a crisis or a calamity, people can choose either to let it ruin their lives or to learn from it and move forward. It's essential to understand the consequences of personal choices. 
it's possible to let tragedy or trauma become a reason to stop living. But it's also possible to live through extreme circumstances and commit to a life that has meaning, a life that matters. That's a wonderful message. And we're going to be sharing out uh, I shout out or we're going to be sharing that in a second about all your various nonprofits and your efforts to squash anti-Semitism and bullying and just overall negativity and hatred in the world. Um, you're definitely a champion for that. We have a question from Claudia. Claudia, you had a very specific question because you read his book. Um, go ahead and unmute to ask. How do you feel? When you see nowadays people ignorance out, what happened? What are the feelings that happen when you see ignorance, when you see anti-Semitism, when you see deniers and all of that nonsense? What, what kind of uh, emotions get elicited? It hurts me very much. And this is why the Zahor Holocaust Remembrance Foundation is doing everything humanly possible to, to keep reminding this world and to do everything possible to do something to stop the hatred. Because remember, Hitler and the Nazis did not start with killing. It all started with hate, hate propaganda. And this is how it began. The hatred has to stop. Why hate? Hate and love are both contagious. So choose love. Hatred has to stop. There's no reason for hate. We are all God's creation. And as God's creations, we, we all have the right to live in this world and to, to, to be free and to, to live a normal life. We should not hate. And a big, big part about mess, uh, Ben's message is making people aware of everything that happened. And so Ben's organization, Zahor Foundation, created ZahorLearn.org, and that is in the chat. Definitely check that out, as well as his book. Um, our next question from, comes from Nuria, and after Nuria, we'll have Elena. We'll go with a few more questions, then we'll let Ben go. Uh, Nuria, go ahead and unmute to ask. Um, hello, Ben. Uh, what, I was wondering what happened to your sister, Lola? Oh, Lola survived. She was the only survivor. And she and I were the only survivors out of a family of seven. And Lola had a normal life. She lived here in America, and she was an artist. Now, those paintings that you saw, they were all done by Lola five years after liberation, after the war was over, out of memory. She was a great artist in, in New York. Um, what can I tell you? She passed of normal circumstances. She was 95 years old. And um, we're so thankful for her recollections and, and her, her paintings of that. And you guys can also catch those paintings on ZahorFoundation.org. Uh, again, that's in the chat. We have Elena. And Elena has a very good question. This is one of my the most fascinating uh, questions to me because it was I, – I, go ahead, Elena. Go ahead and ask. So um, when did you start sharing your story with the rest of the world? Okay. Actually, for many years, I didn't talk about the Holocaust because I didn't want my children to grow up feeling they are different in any way from a normal American kid. They went to public high school and they, they had friends from all these different nationalities and, and my house was a very happy house. But my grandson in fifth grade calls me up. He called me on the phone. He says, Papa, 
My teacher heard that you are a Holocaust survivor. She wanted to know if you would come into school and tell your story. Well, when my grandson asked me, I couldn't deny it. I couldn't deny it. And I figured, well, it's time. Listen, my children are grown up. They have children of their own. It's time to do it. So I went to, just to tell you, I went to fifth grade. What do you tell kids at fifth grade? I was afraid they're going to I have nightmares. But I went there and they gave me from 10 to 11 to speak. I spoke from 10 to 11, from 11 to 12. The school bell rang for lunch and nobody got up. These kids and the school teacher chased them out to go for lunch. They surrounded me in the hallway. They didn't go for lunch. They just wanted to ask me questions and, and touch me. This showed me that the world has to know, Ben, you can't keep it quiet. And this is when I started to talk. From that moment on to this date, I'm still talking. And I'm talking about now about 25 years already, I'm telling. Everybody who will listen, I'll tell the story. And by the way, Ralph, I don't mind if this if the this the students have more questions. Sure, we have we have a lot. And uh, yeah, um, so and we can't thank you enough. Uh, you guys know Ben is ninety four years young, and uh, the the man has more stamina than anyone I've ever met in my life. <laughs> so, and he's traveled all over the world to share his story and, and spoken probably hundreds of thousands, if not millions, as far as through technology. So definitely check out, we also have on here, I shout out. Can you tell the kids a little bit about that organization and, and what that mission is? Sure. Um, let me take you. All right. Okay, one second. All right, I'll show them this picture. I shout out. Uh, one day I in school, after I got through speaking, one young lady, something like your age, uh, asked me, Mr. Lesser, what can I do? I'm just one person. What can I do to help? I says, you can shout out. When I walk out of that school, I said to myself, Ben, what did I just say? Uh, you shout out. What does that mean? You can shout out. So you shout out and it disappears in this thin air. That's when I started in my foundation and I shout out where when you shout out, it goes, um, it stays on my foundation on the shout out for generations to come. If you wish to submit your photograph, you can submit your photograph with your shout out. You shout out for peace, against bullying, against hate, for love. You, you can shout out for many things and your shout out will remain on the website for generations to come. Imagine you punch in your name and your shout out will come out with your picture. Can you picture this? Years from now, this will still be there. So we're looking for 6 million shout outs to compensate for the 6 million silenced voices. So yes, you can help by shouting out. And that is a noble cause. And we have that in the in the chat, the link. So please, when we're done today, guys, if you could do that for Ben, go ahead and shout out on, on his website. Um, we have a question from Lajos. Uh, Lajos, you can unmute to ask. Go ahead. Yeah. So what was the process of moving on after the catastrophe you experienced? 
the Bearded <laughs> Pig. I gotcha. He wanted to know what was the process of moving on uh, when you came over to America after you emigrated and trying to overcome that PTSD, unimaginable. Uh -huh. Okay, the process of me moving on is by starting the Zahor Foundations that helped me because through the Zahor Holocaust Remembrance Foundation, I can now um, reach on Zoom like I did today, thousands and thousands, millions of, of people. And I'm so happy that they can hear me. And this is my goal in life, to reach as many people as possible. I also give out these pins. The little pin is Kosas Sahor, means remember, remember the Holocaust. Those pins I give out to all of my listeners in person, but I can't give it out to you because you are on Zoom. I can't hand it to you. But I have given out over a million and a quarter of these pins to people who have listened to me. And so, uh, get, they can access that stuff on the website through zahorafoundation.org. So if you're interested in receiving a Zahor pin, definitely check that out. Um, and a very interesting thing, Ben is kind of a trailblazer when it comes to virtual education, where if you wanted to jump on his uh, foundation's curriculum website, it's free. There is an artificial intelligence version of Ben on there to where you can ask him up to 500 questions and he'll talk to you and, and answer those. Um, so I, I think that that's a really cool opportunity for you guys if you would like to share that out with all of your friends. Um, so I have a, we'll do a, a, we have a couple more questions. I'm gonna let you go. Um, <clears throat> before one of the kids want to know before the uh, teacher of your grandson knew that you were a survivor, did your kids in fact ever know that you were a survivor? How was that kind of brought up as a parent? My, my kids always knew that I was a survivor, but we didn't talk about it. They didn't ask because they figured it hurts too much to talk about. But they knew. Um, but after my grandson asked me to speak about it, now everybody knows. And in fact, my kids are helping me in the Hor Foundation to dis to disseminate the word of Zahor, remember the Holocaust. I remember indeed, and one of the kids brought up that a, a, a recent concentration camp um, uh, secretary just got prosecuted this morning. So yeah. it's this history isn't that far removed. And so we definitely have to keep this history alive. Uh, it's on you guys as individuals and citizens of the world to keep yourself educated to ensure that this stuff doesn't get repeated. Um, before we go, is there, uh, is there any kind of advice that you want to have for these kids as they go off into the world and become um, adults, adult citizens of the world, what kind of lessons should should they learn from your story? So Ben, what, what advice would you have for these kids as, as they go off into the world and okay. shape who they are? The only advice I have to them is stop the hatred. Just stop the hatred. Instead, love. You know, when you bullying is a form of hatred. When you bully someone, that person will remember who bullied him. And you're making an enemy. So when you graduate high school, you're going to have enemies out there if you bully them. Bullying is a form of hatred. Hatred has to stop of any form. You could live a wonderful life, a beautiful life, without ever hating, hating anything. That's all I can uh, give you advice to stop the hatred. It's absolutely perfect, Ben. And your message is is... Uh, a message of love and mercy and kindness. And, you know, we cannot thank you enough for spreading this 
all over the world, near and far, and spending time with us today. So before I end this meeting for all, before I let you go, I'm going to allow everyone to say a quick thank you, and then and then I'll end the meeting. And a recording of this will be available later, along with all the links that were shared, so you guys can check out Ben's book. So can we all say thank you to Ben Lesser for taking time thank out of his so Thank you so much. Thank you so much.